I'd like, like to welcome everyone to the first of our Diabetes Circle uh, Media Fora. Hopefully this will become um, one of a series in themes related to the uh, World Diabetes Day theme that takes place every year on November the 14th. Now of course diabetes doesn't last a day. Diabetes is every day. And I have two people with me today that can um, tell us a lot about what it's actually like to live with diabetes in the developing world. And I think this is a very important message to share. Um, we have two real champions of diabetes, um, and particularly for um, children and other people living with diabetes um, in the developing world. We have with us um, Graham Ogle. Um, Graham is the program manager of the International Diabetes Federation's Life for a Child program. And we have Ron Raab, and Ron Raab is the president of the Insulin for Life program. And I, what I'd like to do is I, I won't spend too long introducing them, I'd like to hand over to them to let them just um, tell you a little bit about their respective programs um, and what they do, um, a little bit of their view of uh, diabetes, particularly type 1 diabetes in the developing world, and then open that up for the possibility of questions. Uh, my role will to be facilitate some of those questions and ask a few questions um, that I think might be poignant and helpful. And uh, we have other people here that can, that can help bring, um, bring out some of the facets of these programs through questions. So uh, no further ado, I'll hand over then to Ron Raab first. Ron? Okay. Uh, thanks, Phil. Um, well, you, you've asked me uh, what Insulin for Life does and why it does it. Um, the, the reality is uh, that, that diabetes is, you could almost call diabetes, type 1 diabetes, that's the insulin dependent uh, diabetes that affects, uh, has onset in young people, is, is really, a, you could almost consider it to be a luxury disease. So um, people in the developed countries uh, have access to this uh, life-saving medicine, but uh, most people uh, in developing countries where they have to pay the full price or for other reasons, um, lead a very tenuous life um, and die often a very painful and sad death um, because insulin is, a, is, a, is a, an essential medicine to stay alive for these people. Um, so um, having done some international work uh, in, my pro in my professional life and also uh, perhaps understanding it from the perspective of a person with diabetes as I, as I have had diabetes for 50 years uh, and often imagined what it would be like not to know that there was another vial in the fridge, um, it must be a terrible feeling, I became aware that um, insulin uh, is often being um, wasted in developed countries for all sorts of reasons. So in 1984 I set about uh, collecting what I thought would be small amounts of insulin and uh, sending them to organisations which uh, I knew to be reliable. Well, from the first vial in 1984, the insulin pretty much flooded in, which was telling us that there was a lot of insulin available that would otherwise end up in the rubbish bin. So that, that's the basic idea of Insulin for Life. It collects Rolls-Royce insulin, uh, or, or Lamborghini insulin, if you like, um, uh, in date, uh, unopened, and no longer needed. So it's really the next destination is the rubbish bin. Um, now you might ask why is it being wasted? Well insulin's wasted for all sorts of reasons. Um, there might be leftovers from camps, children's camps, there might be uh, uh, supplies that the nurses have ready to give to the patients which uh, are beginning to approach their use by date. Um, and then there might also be um, people who uh, have changed their types of insulin and uh, the, the nurse uh, uh, carefully uh, screens that person and asks them to to bring in their in date unopened no longer needed insulin. Now that's the basis of the program and I guess it's a very simple idea but what we've been able to do is organise that uh, very professionally, um, high standard of quality control, um, every vial is, 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 is re batch number is recorded, uh, we're very careful where we send it and we have all sorts of, we have a, a, a signed agreement before we send this, these things overseas. Um, so uh, it's a simple idea but I think we've turned it into a reality in the, you know, and, and it's actually saving significant numbers of lives in, in developing countries. People like me and people like, uh, uh, you know, people who, who, are, who are listening to this broadcast if they were living in developing country, they would be struggling and they may not be alive. And it's 
to the numbers of people we're able to supply. It's this insulin that's keeping them alive. And it's also test strips as well. We focus on insulin test strips. So that's the basic model. Insulin that would otherwise be wasted is collected by us in six centres around the world, uh, UK, Austria, Germany, uh, United States, New Zealand and Australia. The headquarters are in Australia. Um, and we're able to respond to emergencies. Uh, we always have a supply ready to go the next day. Um, and we also have long-term sustainable programs, some countries we've been involved in for many years. Um, and uh, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Thanks, thanks very much for that, for that overview, Ron. Um, this, this year is um, the International Diabetes Federation's um, Year of the Child, and that's where the focus is. So we'll go to Graham now to hear about your program. And, and perhaps, Graham, you could give a sense of uh, how many children there are in, in the developing world with diabetes at present. Thanks, Phil. Uh, children who develop diabetes, uh, they will, they'll be quite well, and then over a period of a couple of months, they'll, they'll start to lose weight and pass a lot of urine and drink a lot, and then they'll go into a state called ketoacidosis and, and coma. And at that stage, the diagnosis is usually made, and then without insulin, these children will, be, will die within a week. And then they face that peril all through their lives, that if, if insulin's withdrawn for, for more than a few days, that they, they will die. And we know from reports in many developing countries that some children die undiagnosed, other children die uh, where well, the diagnosis is made, and then the family if, has to make the choice, can they afford to, to pay for the insulin? In some countries the government's able to pay for insulin, but in other countries the government can't. And some families have to make the terrible choice between do they educate the other four children in the family or do they provide insulin for the child with, with, with diabetes. And we, one of the countries our uh, program helps, for instance, is in Bolivia. And the average wage in Bolivia is 70 US dollars a month. And the, the support that we provide in partnership with Insulin for Life is worth 84 dollars a month. And so you just look at the numbers and, and do, the, do the families spend all their income on, on, on medical care for one particular child or do they spend their income on food and education and, and health care for the whole family. So it's a terrible dilemma. And the, the IDF Life for a Child program started seven years ago in response to this. And we started in three pilot countries in the Western Pacific and now we help children in 17 countries around the world. And we're supporting close to a thousand children now total in these countries. And what we do is we support existing diabetes centres. We don't try and go in and, and set up a new program in these countries. There's, there's doctors and nurses in these, in these countries who know what to do, who just don't have all the resources to, to do what they'd like to do. So we raise funds, which are then used to purchase insulin and test strips or pay for education, uh, diabetes education services in these countries. And then these centres are able to care for their children adequately and then what's happened is that once we, we get the capital going, they're able to then move out and help centres in the regional areas as well. And so in some of the countries where we work, like Bolivia and Rwanda, it's now helping all the children and youth with diabetes in the country. And we also provide funds for capacity building. We help them set up uh, diabetes registers to, to help with, with getting their data together and to take the, whatever the care they can provide to take them to a new level. And in, in some countries, uh, children with diabetes have never been able to do self-monitoring to be able to check their blood sugar level two or three days which two or three times a day which is uh, a standard treatment in the rest of the world and so we've been able to introduce self-monitoring in some of these countries as well